Think Forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. All of us. So individuals do matter. And I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. Old age puts our society to the test. What is the meaning of life for that society? What societal benefits are shared as we go through the lifespan? And to what extent is our society willing to help us when we approach the end of life? In thinking about this important obligation, I want to focus on three themes. These themes will be themes of diversity, the fact that each of us age at different rates. The second theme is that we have a considerable amount of choice regarding the nature, quality, and extent of our old age. And the third theme is wealth and poverty because our historical accounts, our literary sources, and our cultural uh, impressions tend to bias this view toward a more affluent view of aging and tends to obscure the chasm that can exist between rich and poor. Now, to do this, what I'd like to do is to speak about aging from seven different perspectives. And I'm going to propose the ambitious task of doing that in approximately 20 minutes. But I think that the issues of aging are so interesting, diverse, and complex that I would really like this to be a discussion and a dialogue. Uh, those of you who know me know that I can easily fill an hour of rambling, but I would prefer to focus my remarks and then uh, use your questions as a way to focus more deeply into aspects of aging. So the first area of inquiry I want to consider is the biology of aging. Here there is a central fact chronologic age and biologic age are not the same thing. As we age, we become more unique and differentiated. We become less like one another. And this has profound implications in terms of our social policy because if we entertain a one-size-fits-all approach to health care, then we are destined to mistreat many people who have very special needs. In my medical practice, I see people every day who have different aging in different organ systems. Some people have young brains and old joints. 
young hearts and old bladders, or whatever it might be. So again, the central fact that we age uniquely and individually through life has very important policy implications. And the way that we think about those changes, the malaise that we feel with the changes that naturally occur at we age is a reflection of our societal values and how they influence our own views about how our bodies change over time. We could spend a lot of time talking about that. The second area has to do with changes in our intellect. Are we destined to become senile, forgetful, and fall into a state of mental disrepair? And the answer to this question is no. For most of us, the fear that we will become dependent on others because of mental impairments is ungrounded. To be sure, there are a number of conditions that cluster in old age. And I'd like to remind you of three very important symptoms. The first symptom, forgetting where you placed your car keys. You may know someone who has this symptom. The second symptom, forgetting someone's name at a social event. The third symptom, walking into a room and saying, now what did I come in here to get? <laughs> These are symptoms of being perfectly normal. These are not the early warning symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Why is this funny and a concern? Because in our society, an older person cannot afford to make a mistake. So that if we forget someone's name, uh, I have a wonderful family, I have a beautiful wife, I have two uh, children, uh, two boys, uh, 17 and 13. As far as my 17-year-old son is concerned, I already have progressive dementia. <laughs> he already knows as much as I do and then some. So there are these differences in our expectations about mental status. And in a way, I'd like to say that in regarding mental capabilities, that aging, particularly mental status changes, may be a myth. And that what happens is that we grow old in other people's eyes, and then those other people convince us that we're old kind of gets back to the old Satchel Page quote, you know, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? But because our society is intolerant of mistakes in elderly people, my advice to medical students at the University of Virginia is simply this. If you have a secret fantasy, do it now. Don't wait until you're 75 or 80. If you want to go to Las Vegas and play the slot machines, if you wait and do that at the age of 75 for the first time, your family's going to wonder, is this person <laughs> all of a sudden developed a problem? The third area, I've spoken about changes of our body and the uniqueness that occurs over time, the changes in our intellect. Creativity has no upward age limit, and we could speak about that for several hours. The third area has to do with the psychology of aging, the view from within. How do we relate to these various stereotypes and views about aging? And we can tell those stereotypes very quickly and simply by looking at the television, by looking in print media, and getting a sense of how older people are portrayed in the media. If we watch the evening news now, the message becomes loud and clear. If you want to be happy in contemporary America, you need to be young, good looking, and regular. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a number of destructive stereotypes 
and I'm going to overstate them to make a point, but these are very insidious in our society. One stereotype portrays the older person as a doddering old fool, a forgetful, stumbling around kind of person. Every, everyone's worst nightmare and stereotype about aging. And there are a number of those uh, in, the, in the media. And not too long ago, there was this a complete denial of aging stereotype of some automobile company had this uh, automobile going through a children's playground and then it said aging ahead and the car makes some detour and goes off into the desert somewhere to do who knows what. Um, but that's one type of stereotype. The other type of stereotype is more subtle. That shows the older person in a state of continued youthful vigor. The older woman who jumps off the golf cart, waltzes in, puts on a plastic undergarment to control urinary leakage, and then goes off in the sunset with her husband. The problem with that is not so much that it's a positive image, that's wonderful, but when people don't live up to these unrealistically high ideals, they seem to think the problem is within them rather than having it as a societal stereotype. The fourth area, family as the microcosm of culture. People who give care to others when they need it tend to receive care themselves when they need it. And in societies that treat children well tend to also treat uh, older people in that society well. This is a lesson that seems to resonate throughout history and through various cultures. Nowadays, our family network is different. In the past, the care of elderly people was a societal, the family caring for that person was a societal expectation. And it still is a major and dominant expectation. But things have changed so that we tend to rely more on others and government and state programs for that care rather than our family resources. How do we deal with these changes in our family? The fact that families used to live very close together. It was a more agriculturally based program. Now family members are all over the globe. Uh, regretfully, the divorce rate is uh, about 50 percent, so that with increases in longevity, it's possible to see five generation family reunions, but it's also possible for a young child to have six living grandmothers. So these are difficult challenges that our society faces. Generally speaking, older people do well in societies that are stable uh, and supportive. Societies that are on the move, nomadic societies, older people tend to do not as well. And we can make up our own views about the kind of society that we have now in America and the ways that that society is evolving. The fifth area, work and retirement. Retirement does not mean to me enjoying pleasures denied by work. It often means the beginning of an empty future. To avoid that emptiness, we have to prepare to have projects that go through our entire lifespan. There are a number of activities uh, around the Charlottesville area. This is a very rich and robust community, a lot of diversity, a number of social programs, uh, the Charlottesville Senior Center, the program at Java, a number of community agencies work hard to provide those options. But we need projects that give meaning to the time that we have. And I would say to you that in some ways, retirement has almost lost its meaning. It may mean uh, a change in the pay scale, but not a change in health or productivity. The sixth area, next to the last. The sixth area has to do with the sociology of aging. 
the fact that old age uh, and members of a society resonate through a sense of group identity. And we see this today in the news. We see an individual soldier on the battlefield feeling a sense of responsibility, pride, and participation as being part of a larger group. So as we age in our society, how do we feel? How does the group treat us? What kind of support is there? There are debates now about generational equity. Will there be the funding for older people who may need health and services in the future? What about the complexity of our social programs? Our social, um, our medical and health care programs, of which I'm a, uh, a member, uh, are becoming more and more complicated. And I'm not convinced that with that complexity, we're gaining increase in security or in quality. Now, to be sure, there are mer medical errors that occur, and they need to be changed. But I believe that the basic mindset that we have, that we have this complex system and that all we have to do is just inject some quality into that system is necessarily going to solve it. And I think we're very close to the point now that if we simply simplified the process of care, simplified the paperwork, simplified the access, give people choice about who they want to see, that that simplification would improve the quality by allowing people to spend time on what's important. Because I have to say to you that in our contemporary system, when I admit a person to the hospital, I have to fill out the equivalent of an income tax form. And it's getting more complicated. And having lived for a while in Rochester, New York, I'll say the equivalent of a New York State income tax form. Some people know what I mean by that. So, Again, the fact that we, that healthcare professionals, in the interest of safety, doing the right thing, accountability and responsibility, the fact that we spend more time with paper than with people, to me, indicates a fundamental flaw in our system. The last area. This has to do with the power of mortality. And the fact that old age is counterpoised against the certainty that we die. The meaning of life and in old age really is reflected because it's counterpoised against this certainty. To me, understanding and appreciating our mortality invigorates and gives our lives a sense of vitality. Because what it means is that our moments cannot be relived. No matter how affluent we are, what uh, our health status is at the moment, we have to confront a finite future. The death rate in this country is one per person. <laughs> it's remained remarkably constant. For <laughs> But rather than, again, being a pre-morbid preoccupation with death, to me, it adds a sense of expectancy and excitement, awareness, appreciation. It means that when I kissed my wife goodbye this morning, that it was with the awareness that we were going to be apart, that I don't have any guarantees. I know the law of probability is in my favor and that I will very likely get home this afternoon and enjoy a wondrous reunion with her. But I don't, again, every time I drive 29, I'm reminded that <laughs> we don't have guarantees. And if my time comes today and I look death in the face, at the very least I can say, I've said my goodbye. I will not have that I wish I had done this, that, or the other. So in summary, when we think about aging, we're not thinking about a disenfranchised minority. We're thinking about our own selves in the future. And therefore, the issue is not 
what does aging mean or what can I do? The question is, who are we becoming? What are we sowing now and what is it that we wish to reap? And from a standpoint of health policy, because I know that there are some very important and influential people in this room, uh, that we will be the architects of the geriatric health care system of the future. Because of that fact, we'll get what we plan for and deserve. And who among us does not deserve the very best? I'll stop there and be delighted to entertain your questions. Who would like to begin the discussion? Do you think that sometime the right to die will be a subject of um, geriatrics? We do a pretty lousy job of care at the end of life in this country. And there are a number of aspects and reasons for it. I think for one thing, we have successfully insulated ourselves from death. In the old days, and not that long ago, uh, when people celebrated Thanksgiving and there was a turkey or a ham or chicken on the table, it wasn't a great mystery where that food came from. And people said grace around the table in this basic celebration that life lives on life. And whether you're a vegetarian or not, our bodies are sustained by other living beings that we have to consume in order to maintain our health. Nowadays, it's too easy for us to zip through the uh, takeout line of a fast food restaurant or a cafeteria and fail to appreciate that sacrifice that has been made for our behalf. And in addition, it's the natural human cycle of birth and living and death becomes very mysterious at the end. So I think that it gives death more power over us than it needs to. And this is played out in hospital after hospital in this country, uh, and I'm not going to pick on our own hospital here at UVA that has a very fine palliative care program. We have Hospice of the Piedmont here. We have a number of organizations that are attuned to that. But even so, uh, there is this psychology in medicine in a global nature to do more, to squeeze out every last bit of living you can. And again, because the death rate is one per person, from my value structure, there is a time where the quality of remaining life becomes much more important than the quantity. So we have a long way to go. And I ask myself sometimes from a standpoint of the ethics of medical education, what are we teaching our students? What do students see in this regard? And they see a cacophony of mixed messages. And again, from a policy standpoint, they see that sometimes families can be bankrupted because of insensitive state and federal regulations um, that really don't provide the kind of care. So I believe that there is an awareness and the need to deal with end-of-life issues. But I don't think that's going to be solved by handing off that care to someone from a palliative care background. It's something that needs to be put back into the covenant between a doctor and a patient. Having said that, my own observation is that the reason that we require the superstructure that we have now, living wills, durable powers of attorney, documents that everybody has to keep with them or put on their refrigerator with a magnet to make sure that their wishes are honored, while that is a part of our society, to me it reflects a deeper picture. And that is a symptom of an underlying social disease, a loss of confidence in the doctor-patient relationship. If we have that confidence, 
If we develop that relationship, then we have the documentation. Now, to be sure, I am required by law to go over that with my patients. And I do that, but I have to tell you in, uh, deep in my heart that even though a person has signed an advanced directive, it doesn't make me sleep any easier at night. Now let me tell you what I mean. I will never, ever, ever go against a person's express wishes. But I also know that people sometimes will change their minds. Next question, yes in the back. When you contemplate the projections for Medicare and people who don't have access to a doctor they care, like or trust, mm -hmm. what, what is to become of people whose doctors are not like you and to whom they have no access? I think that we need to move away from what I would call a kind of fast food approach to health care that basically says one size fits all, come into our particular practice plan, whatever it happens to be. Uh, all of our physicians are pleasant and board certified and, uh, and so forth uh, because that model devalues the nature of a doctor-patient relationship. So let me say, I'll throw my values right on the table. I don't believe healthcare is a business. A part of my soul dies every day when I hear in the walls of academe across this nation. The, the, the medical conversations have changed from what's the latest approach or I'm dealing with this particularly thorny medical problem, can you help me out? The conversations have to do more with market share with developing a new product line, with uh, increasing the throughput in the clinic. So those are the metrics that are used in some places to judge a physician's productivity. My doctor's a great doctor. He has good throughput through his clinic. And so to me, what's missing in the equations is an appreciation of quality. And right now, there's such a gap, there's so much in the middle that people go to various physicians and it's assumed that they're all basically the same. There's no way that a stellar physician can charge more or somehow be acknowledged in the system for having people who want to see that particular person as opposed to next available. And I think for freedom of choice in our society, somehow we need to link the funding of health care back to the individual so those individuals can choose who they want. Many of us will choose convenience depending on the nature of the problem. And that's perfectly okay. I mean, I do it myself. Sometimes convenience is what I want. At other times, maybe it's quality that what I want. And I'm willing to wait if I'm going to see the best or whatever it happens to be, and our system doesn't really allow that. So I'm open for a new experiment in healthcare that somehow maintains freedom of choice, puts the payment control back in the hands of the individuals, and by doing that, I think we will be able to reward quality because people will go to those individuals who they think offer more value for their time and energy.